Hi, this is Pastor Rick, and welcome to our bonus Bible study. Uh, this will be session six on Thursday, October the 15th. Again, our uh, goal is twofold with uh, this series on the Bible Project. We want to learn how to read the Bible really well. And secondly, we're introducing this online resource, the Bible Project, and you can go there and uh, look around all the resources they have for reading the Bible. And if you enjoy the discussion today, I hope that you'll join us for the BBS Zoom at noon. Well, we'll discuss not only last week's where we talked about plot and character, but this week we'll talking about the narrative dimensions of setting and design, the patterns uh, that we can find in the biblical stories. Again, a review, we wanna recap Again, for Protestants, 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 26 in the New Testament. This forms a library, but also a unified story that points to Jesus and the Gospels. And in the Bible, we have three um, types of literature. We have narrative, we have poetry, and discourse. Now, as you know, the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing in on the narrative quality of these stories. It's Jew, Jewish meditative literature, and so the Bible interprets itself. It draws us into the story, and after a while, those stories become our stories as well. Again, last week, we took a look at plot and character, how they play an important role in how we read biblical stories. And today, we want to take a look at the settings and the designs or patterns that are set up in these uh, biblical stories from the Old Testament to the New. All right, so now we want to start with our first video on these settings. And these represent just classic settings that are set in Scripture. And when we hear them, all right, all the red flags should wave. When the Bible talks about Egypt, okay, Egypt plays several roles every time it emerges in Scripture or the wilderness, when the wilderness emerges, and when we read something happening in the wilderness, we need, we need to pay attention, or Babylon, or when it says that the people are moving east, an eastward movement always means something specific, as well as sometimes numbers that are used over and over again, like 40. When you hear the number 40, you gotta pay attention. So. Let's now watch the video, how to read the Bible better, the Bible as narrative, and now we focus on settings. Enjoy. In every story you've ever heard, the action took place somewhere, and that place is called the setting. And since we've been learning how to read biblical narratives, let's talk about how settings work in the Bible. So. Settings are a crucially important tool in the hands of the biblical authors. Really? Yeah, think of it this way. When you start a story, everything is new. The plot and the characters are a mystery until things unfold. Yeah, we have no idea what to expect. Except authors can use the setting of a story to prepare you for what's coming. How so? Well, let's say a story begins in a courtroom. What do you think is going to happen? I expect a story about crime and justice. Yeah, or how about the setting of a dark, old, rundown house? Oh, something scary is about to happen. Exactly. So settings evoke memories and emotions because of other stories you know that happened in similar places. The authors know this, and they can use settings to generate expectations about what could happen in this story. And a good author will get creative with settings, and he'll mess with your expectations in order to make a point. This happens in the Bible? All over the place. For example, think about the setting Egypt in the Bible. Yeah, big Middle Eastern empire on the Nile. Sure. Now think about the first biblical story where someone ends up in Egypt. It's about Abraham. God calls him to journey by faith to a new land, and he promises to give him a huge family. So he sets out, but he arrives during a famine. Now, is he going to trust God and stay in the promised land? Or will he leave the land and go look for food on his own? Yeah, Abraham leaves and goes down to Egypt. And there, in Egypt, things go downhill fast. Abraham denies that Sarah is his <laughs> wife to save his own neck, and then Pharaoh tries to marry her for himself. Okay, first impression of Egypt, not a great place to visit. But God then rescues them. He strikes Egypt with plagues, and so Pharaoh relents and sends Abraham away with loads of wealth. So, what do we learn about Egypt as a setting from this story? 
It's the place people end up because of stupid decisions, but it's also a place where God comes and rescues his people. Yep, and the next main story in Egypt follows the same pattern. Abraham's great-grandsons make a bunch of stupid choices, and they eventually lead them to Egypt because of another famine. Down in Egypt, though. So generations pass, and the family ends up as slaves in Egypt, and what do you think's gonna happen? God's gonna send some plagues and rescue his people. It's like he saw it coming. After the Israelites get back to the Promised Land, God tells them to never go back to Egypt for any reason. It's the place of trouble and oppression. So when future biblical characters go to Egypt, I'm supposed to cringe. Right. Like Solomon, at the peak of his wealth and power, he married the king of Egypt's daughter, and then he started sending Israelites there to import Egyptian stallions. And then, a generation later, that alliance goes bad. Egypt oppresses Israel all over again. So biblical settings carry with them all these memories of previous stories, which create expectation. Yeah, it's a brilliant literary device to infuse stories with meaning. Now, biblical authors, they're brilliant. They can build up your expectations, but also creatively mess with them. Like how? Egypt's a perfect example. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is born, his family flees to Egypt. Uh-oh, so this is a problem. And you would think so, but pay attention. Instead of Egypt being the bad place, it's the place of safety. Because who are they fleeing from? King Herod, who is behaving exactly like Pharaoh did, but he rules Jerusalem, not Egypt. Matthew is messing with me to show how Jerusalem has become Egypt. Exactly. You can find these kinds of patterns in many different biblical settings. Babylon, Moab, the wilderness, Bethlehem, the list goes on. Which is a big list. And it gets bigger, because sometimes the setting isn't just a place on a map. It's a type of situation, but they work the same way that settings do. For example, when people move toward the east, expect trouble. Adam and Eve were banished to the east, and then Cain wanders to the east. People move to the east to build Babylon. And all of these narratives are designed to point forward to when the Israelites as a people will be exiled to the east in Babylon. Ah, nice. Which leads to one more type of setting in biblical narrative, and that's time, or how long events take. Like, time periods of 40 are often associated with stories where people's faithfulness is tested. Noah in the boat for 40 days and 40 nights. Then he gets off and gets totally drunk. The Israelites got impatient during their 40 days of waiting for Moses on Mount Sinai, so they made the golden calf. Or after the Israelite spies investigate the land for 40 days, the people rebel, so they have to wander in the desert for 40 years. But then there's the story of Jesus, who was tested in the desert for 40 days, and he reverses the expectation. He overcomes the test. Exactly. Across the whole Bible, places, situations, and time periods become full of meaning by evoking memories and setting expectations. And the New Testament authors reuse all of these settings to show how Jesus is the one carrying our world from the garden, out of Egypt and the wilderness, and into the new creation. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video on how to understand setting and biblical narrative. We hope you enjoyed it. We make lots of other videos in this series, How to Read the Bible. Check them out here on YouTube. The Bible Project is a nonprofit, crowdfunded animation studio, which means you can join us and help us make more videos in the future. You can learn more at thebibleproject.com. Okay, I just love that, that uh, video on settings. It helps. Boy, it helps us really pay attention to certain dimensions of stories that we're used to hearing over and over again. But now we want to move from settings to patterns or design, and that there are certain designs or thematics that we encounter over and over again. And here, they'll lift up the idea of temptation patterns, who is tempted and falls, who is tempted and, and falls, but who is tempted and becomes a champion. Uh, that's one pattern, but also how God leads us through waters, right, to a new land. And this whole idea of leading through these dangerous deep waters and coming out the other side to a new land is, again, one of those designs that's repeated in the biblical narrative over and over again. So now let's watch the video again, where they help us in how we read the narrative, the stories in the Bible. Enjoy. 
We've been exploring how biblical narratives work, and it turns out stories in the Bible are like any other story. You've got to pay attention to the characters, the setting, and the plot. Yeah, these are the basic tools an author uses to help readers see the meaning and significance of the events. Now, it's time to learn one final skill that will bring all these elements together, how to detect design patterns in biblical narrative. What do you mean by design patterns? Well, the biblical authors have shaped all these elements, character, setting, and plot, to create series of repeated patterns that weave through story after story and tie them all together. When you notice these patterns, you'll see how different stories across the whole Bible have been coordinated to emphasize key themes. This sounds interesting, but how do you know how to find a biblical pattern? Well, biblical authors do it subtly. The best way to catch on is to watch them embed key words and images that link stories together. Take, for example, one of the main themes of the Bible, the complex and tragic human condition. Okay. So let's start at the beginning, where God is making a really good world. Right, seven times it says God saw that it was good. So those are clearly important words. Now watch. God appoints two characters named human and life to rule this world on his behalf, and they're told that everything is good for them to eat. Except for the tree of knowing good and evil. So then the humans doubt God, and in Genesis we read, they see that it's good to take this knowledge for themselves. Then we read, they desire to become wise. And then finally, they take what they want. And everything falls apart. This story is about the human condition. And on its own, it's a really powerful story, but the biblical authors don't leave it there. They turn it into a pattern. It happens again with Abraham and Sarah. God brings them into the promised land, promises them a child, but they don't trust God. They get impatient and we read the same words. They see their Egyptian slave. They take her and do what is good in their eyes. You get it? Yeah, the stories match. Then you get to Aaron at Mount Sinai and we read how he sees and then takes the gold of the Israelites to make the golden calf. Or there's the story about Achan who sees the gold of the Canaanites. He desires it and takes it for himself. This the pattern highlights how one person's temptation can create suffering for many people. Exactly. It's just like the story of Saul, where we read that the Israelites see him. They desire him and take him as their king so they can be like all the other nations. And Saul's reign leads them to destruction. Or there's the story of David, which says that he sees Bathsheba. He desires her and then takes her and then kills her husband. And then David's family starts destroying each other. So you see, it's just one basic theme repeated over and over. These stories are all designed to show the temptation pattern. Which is kind of a downer. But the repetition builds up anticipation. Perhaps someone will come and break the pattern. This is why the stories of Jesus have been designed to carry the patterns forward to their climax. Really? Yeah. Like, what does Jesus say when he's faced with his greatest temptation to avoid dying on the cross? Uh, not my desire, but your desire be done. So the pattern flips, and you have one person resisting temptation, and his suffering provides life for many. Very cool. Can we do one more? Totally. How about a big one? How God brings humanity through chaotic waters into a new world. It starts on page one, where God separates these dark, chaotic waters. Yeah, dry land emerges as a home for humans to flourish. Then the pattern reappears with the chaotic waters of the flood. God rescues this remnant, Noah and his family, through the waters so that they can step onto dry land and become humanity 2.0. Now, does that basic storyline remind you of anything else? Oh, right, the famous Exodus story. Yeah, exactly. That's when God saves his chosen people from Egypt by leading them through the waters onto dry land. While Pharaoh and his army is destroyed. The pattern repeats later with Joshua and the Israelites. They pass through the waters of the Jordan into the promised land. Yeah, you got it. So now you can see how later biblical authors will project this pattern into the future. Like Isaiah, he hoped for a new exodus with a new king leading God's people forward into a new creation. And in this repetition, the nations become the chaotic waters. Ah, uh, so you can see how combining all these patterns brings us to Jesus. Yeah, notice how all the Gospels highlight that story of Jesus going to the Jordan River. He goes into the waters and back out again. His baptism. That's when God announces that Jesus is his son, who will rescue the world from the chaos of our evil and violence by going into death and out the other side. This is why baptism became such a big deal for Jesus' followers. It's about participating in this ancient pattern, going through the waters of death, following Jesus into the new creation. 
These design patterns seem really important. Yeah, they're actually the main way biblical authors have unified these hundreds of stories together. And every pattern develops a core theme throughout the whole biblical story that leads to Jesus. Great. That's biblical narrative, which makes up over 40% of the Bible. Now, another 30% is made up of ancient poetry. And learning to read biblical poetry is what we'll explore in the next videos. You just saw our eighth installment in the How to Read Your Bible series. Yep. It's uh, not just your Bible. The Bible. The Bible. Our common Bible. And design patterns is something you're particularly uh, jazzed about. That's right. <laughs> I said jazzed. Did I use jazzed hands? <laughs> jazzed. We're about halfway through. Yes. Uh, that, was the, that was the rest of narrative too. So up next is poetry. Yes. How to read biblical poetry. We've got lots of videos. You can find them all at thebibleproject.com. You guys, we are a crowdfunded nonprofit animation studio, and you can help us make the future videos. Check things out at thebibleproject.com.